I'm introducing the moderator who will introduce our wonderful panel. And our moderator is Anthony Barzillet Freund, known to some of us as Tony, who is the editorial director and director of fine art at First Dibs, known as the leading luxury online marketplace for design. Tony. And, uh, and I, I'm Mike, so you can hear me. That's great. So thank you all for coming this morning. I'm very excited about this. Um, these are four incredibly dynamic, smart, young people, and I like being around smart young people, um, so I hope you will too. So I'm going to um, uh, just start with some remarks. So, so I was wandering around this fair, filled as it is with treasures of such diverse character and appeal. I'm reminded once again of the power of beautiful old things, and I'm newly re-energized to proselytize on their behalf. As the culture continues to shift, not just to the new, but to the right this very moment, I'm grateful I have a platform uh, like Introspective Magazine on First Divs to tell people to slow down, take a closer look, hear the stories behind the objects you're admiring on your screen. Indeed, content providers on sites such as First Divs have an obligation, just, uh, not just to entertain, but to educate, inspire, contextualize, and I suppose to compensate for the fact that a website is by its very nature uh, putting a degree of distance between an object and its would-be owner, even if at the very same time it's helping that object uh, reach a greater number of potential owners than was ever possible before. So our culture's love of antiques and historic works of art needs to persist, not just for the sake of these wonderful old things, but in order to advance the future of design and the decorative arts. As everybody knows, certainly the people who are gathered here in, in this room, without a solid foundation, you can't build anything new that's worthwhile. So that's why I'm particularly excited to have these smart young panelists gathered here today. They're all doing exciting things in the contemporary sp sphere, uh, but they're all also firmly steeped in the history of design and the decorative arts. Today we're going to talk to them about the enduring appeal of the past and the ways in which they look to design and art history to guide them into the future. So I'm going to now start with some formal introductions and then we'll get the conversation rolling. Um, since founding her eponymous firm, Alyssa Capito has developed a reputation for creating elegant, bespoke interiors that focus on beautiful textures and clean lines. Recent projects include a complete gut renovation of an Upper East Side pre-war apartment, a modern beach house in Bellport, and a chic family home in Beverly Hills. Alyssa has been widely recognized for her work in the design field, which has been published in such publications as Architectural Digest, First Dibs Introspective, Domino and El Decor, which recently included Alyssa in its prestigious A-list of the top interior designers in the world. Alyssa's um, also, uh, uh, her popular Instagram account has long been cited for being stylish and savvy and has been named one of the top 10 interior design Instagram accounts by the likes of El Decor and British Vogue. Um, also, Alyssa, uh, I know this, this is not her official biography, but Alyssa was a graduate student studying uh, Renaissance art at Columbia. Um, she loves um, art history, and yet she, I think she felt a little bit stymied, uh, I think you told me, sort of being stuck in a library all day long. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so <laughs> on a whim, perhaps you sent your resume to Bunny Williams, and she um, because Bunny likes a uh, good credential, mm -hmm. she hired you despite yeah. your lack of experience and yeah. that you never... I started as an intern. You started. But yes. Yeah, summer internship that turned yeah. into um, mm -hmm. a seat on the TFAF panel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so we're glad you took that, uh, you took that turn. Thank um, you. Next we have um, Eric Wunsch, a member of the Acquisition Committee for Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art. Eric is Chief Operating Officer of the Wunsch Family Office and co-director with his brother and his father, Peter, of the Wunsch Americana Foundation, established by his grandfather, or their grandfather, um, Eric Martin Wunsch, in the 1940s to collect paragons of early American furniture. Many of these are on display in such institutions as the MFA Boston, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, and New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art, of Art which boasts such Wunsch, Wunsch treasures as the John Brown Chair carved by Rhode Island master craftsman John Goddard in around 1760. In recent years, the Wunsch Foundation has engaged with modern and contemporary furniture makers in ways that we'll explore um, as we get more um, 
deeper into the conversation, but these um, talents include Paul Evans, Wendell Castle before he died, um, and uh, David Wiseman, the 38-year-old LA-based designer known for his exquisitely crafted furniture and objects in bronze, porcelain, and marble. Eric's younger brother, uh, Noah, um, has been at Sotheby's for just over two years, first running marketing and digital strategy before transitioning to his role in e-commerce. Prior to Sotheby's, Noah ran business development and strategy for a number of magazines, digital media companies, and startups. Um, in 2017, as Sotheby's VP of Glo and Global Head of Digital um, and Marketing Strategy, he oversaw the acquisition of the AI firm Thread Genius, a team he managed and scaled throughout 2018. And I want to talk a little bit about AE, um, AI a little bit later, artificial intelligence. Uh, Noah has a love of innovation in all its forms, has enjoyed breaking online-only sales records in 2019 with such auctions as 20 Years of Supreme, um, in which Sotheby's auctioned off 248 Supreme skateboards for $800,000. I'm sure you were all aware, aware of that and perhaps own, own a skateboard or two. Um, Stadium Goods, which was the ultimate sneaker collection, which broke the world record for most expensive pair of sneakers, $437,000. And I want to ask you what that was. And then the Friedrich von Hayek sale, in which Sotheby's sold the Economist's Nobel Prize for $1.5 million. And then finally, last but certainly not least, my old friend, my young old friend, um, um, Adam Charlotte Hyman. As principal of Charlotte Hyman and Herrera, Adam has steered the firm toward an ever-widening variety of design pursuits, from residential projects and opera sets to retail environments, art galleries, and product design, notably a line of fabrics, rugs, and wallpapers with the furnishing company F. Schumacher and Company. Working within these various typologies, CHH, um, endeavors to consider divergent art forms and the experience of multiple senses. The firm aims to create spaces that become worlds unto themselves with Gesamtkunstwerk as the core objective. Adam, who has a degree in furniture design and art history from RISD, has been included in Pinup Magazine's Power Generation, Architectural Digest, Architects and Artists You Need to Know Now, Sight Unseen's American Design Hot List, and Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30 in its arts and um, design category. And are you still under 30? Uh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> You're still very young in, in my eyes, though. So as, as you, are you all. So thank you for coming. And um, I guess uh, my first question is sort of is um, if, if each of you could sort of tell me about an antique that first struck your fancy in childhood or young adulthood, and um, what about it you think um, makes it still relevant today to? So mine would probably be the first piece of furniture that really, or antique that really ever made such an impact on me was a Giacometti lamp. Um, it was, I saw it at an auction house, and it was the first time for me that I realized the bridge between art and antiques and how it was, it was so much bigger than what I thought it was. Um, I was very young at the time, but I mean, obviously it's still very relevant. Um, Giacometti's work is timeless and beautiful, but it was the first, the first piece that really made an impact for me because it, it was art in itself. And I think art is very, you know, the definition of art is at the time when I was looking at it was limited mm -hmm. and, and it just opened up sort of what I viewed as art, and um, that was the first thing for me. Uh, Noah and I sort of grew up in, uh, in an environment that had sort of a lot of antique material, uh, but I think the first, uh, <clears throat> the first piece of sort of antique design that I identified with as a, as a collector um, was a, uh, an Alexander Jackson Davis side chair uh, that we have in the collection. Uh, it's a, Alexander Jackson Davis was a, a fairly prominent American architect in the um, early, mid uh, 19th century. Uh, the chair uh, is uh, part of this sort of uh, Gothic revival that's taking place and, uh, and is sort of very much in vogue, and particularly in New York in the 19th century. Um, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a chair maybe, uh, maybe part of a dining set uh, that Davis commissioned for John Herrick's house. Uh, I shouldn't say house, 
castle in Tarrytown. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it, it's so, I mean, I identify with it because it's, it's unusual. It is in no way, shape, or form uh, something that you would identify sort of intuitively as American uh, or, frankly, 19th century. Uh, it's very, very much Gothic inspired. Uh, and I think it's one of the first pieces of uh, sort of period design that I recognized as design, uh, not antique design, um, and design that I could fold into uh, perhaps a more contemporary setting. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. My answer is probably a little bit more lowbrow. Um, <laughs> uh, as Eric said, uh, the Wunsch Americana Foundation really did start with our grandfather, Eric Martin Wunsch, uh, and he was a prolific collector of everything, not just Americana, but Greco-Roman glass, uh, artillery, and artillery, I guess, is kind of my answer. When I was three or four years old, uh, Eric and I went to our grandfather's house, and he had these Civil War swords um, that just had a cork tip uh, that somehow made that safe to play with. Um, <laughs> and I asked if we could play with it, and he absolutely let us. We were just swinging around these gigantic Civil War swords at each other. Um, and I think that while that was crazy and a lot of fun, uh, it also gave us the message, though, that these are utilitarian items, that you don't always have to be precious with antiques, um, that they serve a purpose and a function, and you should enjoy them for what they are as well. Um, so the Civil War swords, and I actually still have one in my apartment now, uh, that was really the first access point for me. Mm -hmm. And Adam? Um, I think it was, uh, I mean, maybe the, the first thing that really uh, really resonated was uh, a pair of, uh, of armchairs that are not so remarkable as a piece of furniture, but they were uh, upholstered with a tapestry that Alice B. Toklas made off of a Picasso design. And, um, and I think there was just something there and sort of the, the fusion of a of an artist's work and a piece of furniture um, and a, you know, a story and a life and a biography and a, um, a, a whole time period kind of embodied by, mm -hmm. um, and a social history embodied by this, this object that kind of uh, woke me up to the idea that uh, furniture had uh, and antiques have a potential to um, uh, tell a story, mm -hmm. I suppose. So a chair is a chair is a chair, or not? Or not? <laughs> Where did you see I that? Um, they're at the at the Decorative Arts Museum in Paris, mm -hmm. and I just had seen them at some point in in, I guess, right at the end of high school, and um, they blew my mind. <laughs> so did you all, as young people interested in decorative art and objects, did you feel different from your peers? I mean, obviously, there's a, a, a wunsch gene that makes <laughs> it very natural to you guys, so within your family unit. But um, I, I imagine a lot of your friends weren't looking at the, the world the way you were looking at it. And I sort of want the second part of that is today, do you find you're still looking at the world a little bit differently than, than your peers, your generational peers? Uh, so I think in the high school or elementary school that I went to, nobody s spoke about Giacometti lamps mm -hmm. very often um, in the playground. But uh, so yeah, it was definitely different. Um, I had a mom who loved exposing me to antiques and stuff like that. And that was actually really um, different than I think what other parents were exposing their children to. Um, in terms of today, I think the conversation definitely has gotten bigger because of Instagram and the accessibility to things that you might not have necessarily been interested in before mm -hmm. in a wonderful way. I think that where it used to be that you had to have somebody like a mother who would expose you to all sorts of amazing things, take you to Connecticut to go antique shopping, you no longer have to have that. Mm -hmm. um, you have a whole world that's open to you that you just have to have an interest and follow the rabbit hole down to things you're interested in. And I think a lot more people are talking about things that they would have not been exposed to before. And I love that. 
So in some ways, the internet is, is kind of disparaged as dumbing down American taste or connoisseurship. But on, on the other hand, it's also democratizing design and, Ab and Absolutely. Making. There's, yes, there, there's definitely like the flip side. It's not all positive. There's the flip side to it, which is dumbing down um, design to the masses, which is so frustrating. But there is that flip side where mm -hmm. you have, you know, you have people who have never been to a villa in Milan that's amazing, but they've seen it on Instagram and they're able to talk about it and they want to go and they plan a trip to go. But before um, this outlet, there was they wouldn't even know about it, mm -hmm. type of thing. And so, yeah, it's it's wonderful to have conversations um, with people and within the design community. I'm very entrenched in the design community, so mm -hmm. I think everybody's talking about this stuff. Maybe it's a little uh, lopsided, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, it's a wonderful part of mm -hmm. of social media and the internet to be able to have access to things that. I think normally you might not have been able to discover. Mm -hmm. So you obviously, everyone around the table growing up was talking about these things, but when you'd go to school, did they, were you guys freaks? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the important thing is that, uh, you know, not to disparage, but we were kids. It, it was boring for us. I mean, like our grandfather and grandmother would take us to museums and we, you know, we should have taken the time to enjoy that way more than we did. But when you're nine years old, uh, and you're flipping a, an 18th century chair over and looking at the bow and claw feet, you're not <laughs> as enraptured as you should be. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Eric and I really discovered our passion for design later when we, when we did mature at least into young adults, uh, more so than teenagers or children. We definitely weren't going to school and waxing poetic on right. uh, Americana. <laughs> um, but I think the important part, which Alyssa spoke to too, is, is access points. Mm -hmm. um, the people who I speak to who may not be as well versed in the design community, uh, they want to be. They just don't know really where to enter. Mm -hmm. They don't know what door to knock on. They don't know what books to pick up or what conversations to even begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's something that's necessary for us to, to open up, to give those doors. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely been part of the focus for the Lunch Americana Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a question of, of packaging, the way that um, <laughs> like, like Noah said, I mean, I, as much as I would uh, love to uh, to have been sort of passionate about um, about American antiquities and American design while our grandfather was uh, was still alive, uh, you know, the, the way that it was couched us was he was a very very academic collector, uh, <laughs> and there were a lot of very sort of serious academic uh, conversations in the house, and uh, you know, the way that he collected and was predominantly to, to live with his collection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the apartment very much had the feel of, uh, I mean, of a period room, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not necessarily um, uh, super relatable to, mm -hmm. uh, to us, I think, sort of as young people and adolescents, perhaps. Um, at, I wish it had been, but unfortunately it doesn't. But I would argue that even if you didn't realize it at the time, like the seed was planted oh, in absolutely. you guys. And yeah, I yeah. think that's the thing today. You know, it's if you don't plant the seed, if you don't expose a kid to opera when they're eight years old, as much as they may hate it, they're never going they're never going to be able to embrace it as, as an adult. And it's the same if you don't explain to them why a chair is worth spending all the time looking at and flipping over and understanding and understanding its cultural connections, they may never find that, so. Mm -hmm. Right, but it, I mean, it's also something that we hear quite a bit, right, about, uh, you know, a certain generation of collectors lamenting that the next generation uh, is not sort of as, as interested or in tune with, um, with this sort of specific genre of, let's just say, old things in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, it's about how you, how you make it relatable and relevant, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's triggered like 12 things I want to ask you guys, <laughs> but uh, maybe um, talking about your grandfather's uh, period room. Um, and, you know, obviously period rooms have fallen out of fashion. And even, you know, in, in my young adulthood, you know, I remember the epitome of, of, of great taste was French, you know, 18th century rooms completely done. I mean, maybe, Adam, you can talk about uh, how the period room has disappeared, but how I guess the mix is so important because you do mix old and new. Um, but there's always something, a piece of old in it, or just talk about how that sort of can be more engaging to younger people. 
Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I wish the period room, I hope the period room hasn't died um, because I, I love them, but I don't make them. Um, I, I uh, was really struck by this. I, I don't remember the exact quotation now, but um, I had read this book about uh, Dominique de Menil's collecting. And um, she said that, you know, because she lived in this amazing Philip Johnson modernist house in Texas and then filled it with modern art and antiques and worthless Victorian pieces of furniture that sort of looked like abstract paint. I mean, she just was really a creative uh, person that, that was able to combine so many unexpected things. And she said that she thought of a house like a family, that the, you know, the most fun kind of family to be a part of is one that has old people and young people and, um, and babies and you know, people are growing up so you don't know what they're gonna turn out like, it's unexpected, there are risks being taken, mm -hmm. um, but there are also sort of established people that you go to because you know that they'll be able to tell you the right thing or, or what to do in a certain circumstance. And um, it was just a funny, a funny analogy, but it, it, it struck a chord. And I think, um, I think that uh, a lot of times throughout history, also the best interiors are, are really not the, the rooms where everything is, is one thing, but you know, it's, it's rooms that unfold and, and have you know, more histories in them than just sort of one day they were done you know, boom. Mm -hmm. and, and when you go to rooms, I think that maybe you think of as a period room, a lot of times they are composed of things that are from all different periods and have been collected by different generations of a family and put together. And, you know, there's more sort of uh, creative agency in, in, the, in the, the creator of, of the room than, than maybe just, you know, it was done in a, in a, in a year. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. In terms of the mix, Alyssa, you, do you have a preference for, uh, do you always, some designers say every room needs an antique in it to give it life, but um, too many, it's a very, uh, it's a, a balance that has to be struck, right? If there are too many antiques, does the room start to feel um, a little bit fusty? Does it, uh, do you need to always infuse it with something from the 20th century, something from the 21st century, something? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think from my background and the way my brain works, the rooms for me are always very much about a couple of pieces, um, those being antiques or significant pieces for whatever reason, whether they're form or um, uh, just the way they, they look or the history. Um, and then the rest of the room is almost toning it down. Mm -hmm. it's, it's neutralizing it so it creates something different so that it's not just a period room or, or something like that. Um, but then it, it creates a balance. So for me, what I do, I, I think my style in a way is a more minimalist take on traditionalism. Um, so there is the traditional aspect, which is the antiques, but then there's a whole nother layer of sort of, I wouldn't say toning it down because that's, that's not the right word. It's actually creating a juxtaposition that's a little bit more modernist um, with those pieces that have straight lines and um, a cleaner outlook. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it's definitely about the mix mm -hmm. for me. Do you guys, uh, no, this is sort of to you and, and Adam, do you feel your clients are receptive to um, antiques? Are there certain antiques that they're more receptive to than others? Are there certain pieces that they'll say no to? I mean, I, I love um, any piece of American Gothic or English uh, um, aesthetic movement stuff. I, I'll say yes to it immediately. So um, is there something that's just hopelessly out of style now that you could never convince somebody to accept? Yeah, there are two, there are two uh, things that come to mind that I'm always trying to uh, push <laughs> on, on your <laughs> um, uh No, but there, there, are, there are kind of two things that I really love that I, I, I bring up when, when I feel it's right, and usually they don't end up making their way into uh, the, the final result. <laughs> um, 
So one is um, uh, this kind of uh, pastiche Victorian furniture, like paper mache furniture. Um, that's usually lacquered with inlaid shells and maybe scenes of Venice, and they're so amazing. And um, and and actually, it's it's funny because I can usually show you know a variety of references that really resonate with the client where these pieces make an appearance. Um, you know, we're like looking at Helena Rubinstein's apartment and they love everything. And I'm like, and look, there's that chair. It's that weird chair and, I, and you should have one too. And they're like, that's actually the only thing that I don't <laughs> like about it. <laughs> um, but I, I love them. They're very abstract and very weird. And, um, and to me kind of look like sea creatures or something. It's just a very uh, beautiful, weird object. And then the other is, um, and it's kind of a funny one because I, I was getting interested a few years ago in um, Weimar furniture and kind of German German furniture from the 20s um, and a kind of particular strain of, of design that was really spiritual and kind of related to different uh, black forest, creepy kind of uh, carvings and, um, and a, but a weird intersection with modernism. and. Uh, it's it's a that's a complicated period, obviously, um, for pretty much every reason. Reason, um, but it's a cool period of of design and this one little sort of group of designers working um, who are really kind of lost in this country um, for the most part. I mean, we really don't learn about them because we learned that the Bauhaus was the kind of moral. Um, the, the, the moral compass uh, in the design world at that time in Germany. And these guys really lost that, um, that uh, you know, they, they, they lost. So um, we, don't, we don't look at their work, but it was where funny. Do you see, where do you see their work? Where does it come up? It almost never okay. is in the US, mm -hmm. um, but I, I've seen a lot of it in that. Germany and in auctions, you know, they, it comes up in Germany a lot in auctions and mm -hmm. Austria. Um, but it was really radical, crazy stuff. And a lot of it was being done by people that, you know, were uh, certainly not uh, politically, uh, uh, you know, they, they were not evil people. So they were, um, a lot of them were Jewish, a lot of them were artists and very, very much radical thinkers. So it's, it's, a, it's a really cool thing. And it's funny because um, I, I put a piece, a lamp, uh, in a show that we curated um, that was part of this kind of famous room that only exists in black and white photos now. But there's this one lamp, and it has a lampshade that's this kind of triangle with um, stripes, pink and white stripes. and it was in a room that had all, everything was pink and white stripes, and it's this crazy room. And um, everyone that came to the show pretty much said that that was their favorite thing in the show, and none of them could figure out what it was. And a lot of it, you know, a lot of people were kind of designers or architects. Like, what is that lamp? That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of a revelation, you know, I guess just, Sometimes um, some things do really click that, um, or, or maybe some things take a certain amount of time right. to make sense. You know, right. that 10 years ago even, nobody would have wanted to think about that lamp. Right. But suddenly, right. you know, presented in a, in a new concept with a certain amount of time having passed, you know, it looked fresh and new and uh, exciting and, and, and people wanted to know about it. So. Um, those are the two yeah. things that I, I think of. That's really interesting. I think like freshness is, is when people ask me why are antiques going to have their heyday again. I do think that in a way we see so much mid-century modern furniture, so much uh, sort of contemporary pyrotechnics that the antiques are, um, they're not being published so much in, in, the, in the magazines that they're starting to feel fresh again. Um, and so I sort of think, you know, in terms of Americana too, 
um, which, as people know, that market has not done well in the last decade. I think that now it's starting to, um, people are starting to generate interest because style, pe style setters like you guys are turning to it. It's, um, it's a better deal than buying something from restoration hardware. It's, it's a beautiful, it has all those things, patina, craftsmanship, history, provenance. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about, I think one of the slides here shows Reed and Delphine Krakoff's house in East Hampton that has, is, are those Queen Anne um, chairs in the dining room? I mean, that, the, that American you know, furniture looks so fresh and sculptural. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, why the misunderstood American furniture and why it deserves to be understood? and how you're going to make that happen. <laughs> In 42 <Yeah>. words. <laughs> I, we, uh, we were on a panel uh, up at the Wadsworth um, earlier in the year, and I, Thomas Jane, uh, who's on the panel, had a really sort of interesting um, uh, observation about sort of decorative arts, and specifically American decorative arts, and this notion that the word decorative has, has almost become a pejorative sort of in the design field, mm -hmm. that it stands for something that is that's fussy or, uh, or not contemporary, not relatable. Um, and you know, we always go back to this notion, of course, that Chippendale, I mean, when was the golden age of sort of American antiquities collecting? The 90s? Mm -hmm. you know, it, talking you know, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are, are cyclical. It's not to say that we will forever be uh, in love with French post-war furniture or American mid-century. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tastes evolve and change, and you know, it's it certainly, um, <laughs> you know, we don't, uh, you know, my home doesn't look like my grandfather's home. Mm -hmm. uh, my tastes and priorities are different. Um, you know, but fortunately for us, we had this, um, this sort of amazing introduction to uh, to American antiquities, and I should really just fundamentally call it design. Mm -hmm. so I think when we call it antique mm -hmm. or period, that it, it strips away some of the utility. It's mm -hmm. just design ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at looking at most periods of influential and important design, design executed at a very very high level, uh, you know, it stimulates something. That it uh, whether it's rejection or adoption. Um, but that immersion in some sense right, stimulates an idea. And whether you want an apartment full of American antiquities or, or that one sort of odd, um, odd piece that uh, creates texture and interest in a home, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the, I think that's what uh, one should potentially aspire to as a, as a lover of design. Is the word antiquities, I was wondering, you know, the way craft has became a bad word and the craft museum changed its name and abandoned the word. Uh, I'm thinking about another fair that happens here in a few months. Um, it, it was something else, then it was was, and now they've abandoned this year, right? It's going to just be the winter show. They've abandoned the word antiques. Oh, have they? As, yeah. So that's, um, do you see that as sort of, um, cowardice in a way, or does, or is it just that people, people, are, you know, need to be kind of tricked into <laughs> seeing things or not seeing things in a certain way. Yeah, I don't, I don't think of it as cowardice. Um, I do think of it as marketing yeah. and branding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the time the words brown furniture come up in the conversations that we have. Uh, and I mean, asking the audience, what do you guys think of when you hear brown furniture? Is it exciting? <laughs> do you guys, yeah, guys want to live with down. brown <laughs> furniture? doesn't sound great. Um, something like radical design sounds a lot more interesting. Uh, I think Eric saying American design, which was the first time I heard you say that, that was pretty good. Um, we can brand that. That sounds great. Uh, antiques sound like something from yesteryear, because they are something from yesteryear. That's literally what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you, know, you look at every single company, brand, luxury in the world right now, and they're rebranding. Mm -hmm. There was a fantastic uh, image of every single legacy luxury brand's logo maybe three years ago compared to last year, and everyone is taking this kind of block Helvetica font. They're trying to make it more modern, but these are companies that are over 100 years old, and it's reforming what luxury means. Um, yes, I, I do think that Americana, uh, 
antiques, decorative arts, et cetera, the connotations that come with them are dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there will probably need to be a new life cycle and that's probably gonna entail rebranding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's great. So how, what role does technology play in that rebranding? You've you know, mastered Instagram, you have toyed with artificial intelligence. How much um, can we use technology to kind of um, uh, rebrand rebrand uh, antiques? Is that directed <laughs> at me? Um, Do you, when you're, when you're thinking about what image you're going to post, because for those of you who don't know, Alyssa posts images of rooms that she's created herself, but mm -hmm. also images of rooms that you just love, mm -hmm. which you repost. Um, do you think strategically, like I can't put another, you know, 18th century French, you know, armoire, I need to really hit on, genre. I need some, some genre mojo now. <laughs> Is that sort of a mix? Um, not really, I'm a little different from, you know, I'm not promoting one single thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm a little less conscious about uh, rebranding versus, I guess, um, so the answer, the short answer is no. I, I, I don't think of it that way. But in a way, I guess I'm a product of um, what I was describing before of access and, and that type of thing that because I have so much access, I'm interested in so many things. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's an Americana chair that I might be interested in, but there's also a Jean-Michel Frank um, table that I would be interested in, a Royer. Um, sofa that I would be interested because I'm being exposed to so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that individually antiques um, and, and certain periods mm -hmm. should have rebranding in, in the wonderful way that you spoke about in that it's not something to look down upon. It's something that's just more you know, relatable and friendly and they bring them mm -hmm. um, to today. Mm -hmm. um, but on a whole, I guess, I'm a product of that rebranding and that I'm so interested in so many periods. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers yeah. what yeah. you were asking, but. Yeah. Um. Uh, um, has the Wunsch Foundation talk, thought about rebranding? I mean, I know you, you're engaged with uh, contemporary designers. Can you talk about that relationship and what you, why you think that's important? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think Eric said it best where it's, we are contemporary people. Mm -hmm. um, I do live with a bit of Americana, but I also live with Kuramata. Um, Katie Stout, um, Noguchi, a Desiday couch, but I like mixing them all together. And I think, again, that's a new access point narratively. You can see kind of the through lines between, obviously, the most obvious example is Robert Venturi, his Queen Anne and Chippendale chairs, which are radical forms of Americana. But in looking at a contemporary home and seeing how these things mix and match, it gives another access point to Americana and design as well. Um, I don't think that the Lunch Americana Foundation is focused on rebranding, but I, our focus has been working with contemporary galleries, contemporary designers to create access points for a newer generation. Um, also to work with designers to create potential access points for them, though in most cases they're extremely well educated on the form. Um, so we have a commission series that we've been working on for three or four years now where we work with uh, some of the best designers in the world to create new pieces that are not reinterpretations, um, but are somehow influenced uh, by pieces in our collection. Um, we give total creative freedom to the designers that we work with, whether that is Wendell Castle, David Wiseman, Thaddeus Wolf, um, to do whatever they feel fit after seeing the piece that they're working with, um, but to at least make sure that we, we are discussing the legacy and the import of that designer as well and why certain pieces were made certain ways and, and seeing how they play it back in a new way is fascinating. And then do you juxtapose the new pieces with old pieces? Yeah. So an example again is, is the Wadsworth Athenaeum where we do have uh, a Japan Nihol desk um, in contrast or in narrative with the David Wiseman mirror that he created that is narratively connected. Mm -hmm. And seeing the two pieces together, you get it. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, there's very clear through lines between the two, but one was obviously created in you know, the 2010s mm -hmm. uh, and one is hundreds of years old. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a better answer for what I answered okay. before. <laughs> because actually, listening to you talk, I realized that what I do is actually rebranding. Mm -hmm. um, I'm taking antiques that are from a certain period, and I'm, I'm actually 
I'm the rebrander. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm bringing them into today. I'm making them current. Um, and that, that's really what I do. You know, I, I bring them to today. So. I think, you know, the best we interior designers, <laughs> <laughs> the best interior designers are curators, right? Exactly. And there are, I mean, you know, Adam, you talked about finding something that nobody, nobody knew about or nobody knew that they should like. And you're, uh, you know, I, you're, I know Instagramming that crazy Victoriana paper mache uh, thing every day, and eventually somebody's <laughs> going to bite. Somebody, and, one, and, one we're gonna, day. and we're going to see it so featured, you know, in the in the main booth at uh, TFAF. So um, I look forward to that. I don't know how we're doing on time. I have um, I have a bunch of questions, but if anybody here has a question, I'm happy to um, stop speaking for a little bit and, and give one of you a chance to ask something. Uh, thank you to the panel for a really interesting presentation this morning. I have a question uh, regarding the collaboration, uh, or often in my, in my experience there's been not enough collaboration between art advisors or those of us who have more of a history and career in art with interior design and interior decor where, uh, and I've lived in Europe and many, a couple of the major cities in the U.S., and I find that often if the lead with the client is with an interior designer, there's, that the art is often the lowest priority or kind of an afterthought, and especially from a budget perspective. So I'm just wondering how that could perhaps evolve. So that's actually something that's very, very important to me as well. Um, I have a background in art, art history, and then I went on to get a master's in art, in Renaissance art. Um, and I really thought that that was the track that I was going to go through. And I, I worked at Christie's um, all through college. And it's, it's actually something that definitely needs to be spoken more about. Um, one that, you know, there are certain things when you're buying antiques, provenance, et cetera. Um, that aren't taken into account, and also just a deeper understanding of what you're buying and where they're coming from and um, the history behind it because it's so important, and value. I think that's something that's completely missed um, when you're buying without somebody who's really a professional. Um, and, and so it definitely needs to be spoken about more. I, I think that um, a lot of the interior designers don't know who to go to to speak to about that. And I think that's something that um, should be more widely promoted. Uh, we buy a lot through Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips, and, and so we have people there who we, you know, obviously I have a background in it, but I'm not, I, I, I've been out of it for a little bit, and I, I rely on professionals to um, back up sort of what I'm interested in. But yes, absolutely needs to be spoken about more. Absolutely, people who are buying antiques should know what they're buying. They should know the value. Um, it's a very important, important topic to discuss. Adam, do you have experience in fine art purchases with your clients? I mean, a lot of times, isn't it that you inherit art collections that you're working around, I would imagine? Yeah, I mean, we, we have kind of a different, uh, sometimes we are buying art with our clients, but um, we work with a lot of collectors, I guess, already, who are just um, kind of bringing, bringing a particular vision for their collection to the table at the beginning of the project. So we're like already folding that into the way everything is supposed to look. And then when we're looking for something else, it sort of uh, makes sense, if there's something logical that is missing from the overall picture, let's say. But I think, um, I think that just having more kind of educated clients out there and more everybody being more uh, aware of the connection between value and the way something looks and how it was made and where it comes from. I mean, just if everybody, the more people know about all of that, whether it's furniture or art, the more interested they'll be in sort of connecting the, the different parts of the process because they'll see them as sort of the same thing that need to all happen in one conversation. Um, it has always struck me as a very strange thing to sort of decorate a house and then go to an art advisor and 
plug in a bunch of, you know, there's a sort, it's a disjointed process. So I guess it's just about having a kind of educated consumer and uh, people, people learning and being open as much as possible to, to, to that. I think that, you know, it, if we talk about antiques being sort of having accessibility issues, I mean, art is maybe, you know, 10 times less accessible. And, you know, by design, the art market has sort of um, been created to make access, you know, give access only to the special few. Um, and so you need to, I think, either go through an art advisor or somebody or, you know, the auction houses or trust a dealer. Um, but it's very hard and intimidating, and I think a lot of a, a lot of people who actually have the wherewithal to buy good art just don't because they just feel like they can't. It's just too daunting to them. So I feel like if if the antiques world needs to be o open up somehow and educate, you know, the the fine art world even more so. Actually, I feel like First Dibs does a really good job of of the educating the buyer. You know, with the whole introspective magazine and. There, there is a bit, you know, quite a bit of customer service on your end and mm -hmm. sourcing antiques, and we've used that before. Yeah. Um, we're could vetted, probably do we're more. We're a vetted site, which helps, I think, you know, give people confidence that, you know, what they're buying is authentic, and, you know, we have all, you know, huge teams of people mm -hmm. vetting stuff every day. It's not always easy or black and white. So it's, it's you know, if you're just a civilian going into a, an art fair, um, I mean, I think, you know, even the, the dealers here in their booths, they have to, you know, do a better job of engaging people and really educating them and saying, come on in and let me, you know, give you a, you know, give you some candy and tell you about this thing, or I don't know, bribe them with sweets or music or donuts. I don't know what it takes. I'm a donut guy, so. <laughs> talk, maybe talk about, since we're talking about art, talk about your grandfather. You said he had Catholic tastes. I can't recall if it was fine art part of the mix. And so if he, if he lived in a period room, did he also have period art on the walls? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he collected uh, old master paintings, old master drawings. Uh, he loved Dutch old masters in particular. Um, and yes, uh, to Eric's point, the, the room felt it was, it was a period room. Mm -hmm. It was pretty amazing in that way. I mean, being able to see someone who lives that way, because normally, again, you go to the Met or you go to the PMA, which have immaculate, stunning period rooms that you can't possibly imagine sitting in. Mm -hmm. um, and with uh, our grandparents, every Thanksgiving, we would obviously be there, if not multiple times a year, obviously. But our grandfather would sit in the John Brown chair, which is on a pedestal at the Met now. Um, every single Thanksgiving. That was his chair. Mm -hmm. um, and it was wonderful to see. I mean, that was a very inspiring way to grow but up. But just once, once a year? Or would <laughs> no, he would sit in it every day. Every but day. that was the <laughs> ceremonial <laughs> sit down. There was, the, there was bells and music playing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is, it's not to denigrate period rooms. Period rooms are, are, are fantastic resources. They're special and beautiful and inspirational. Uh, it, it is to, to break up sort of the sameness of the way that we show mm -hmm. period design. Mm -hmm. right, to make sure that we are, are providing instruction. And that's really what, um, you know, why um, you know, the world's best designers are incredibly sought after, right? Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. These are not things that uh, are intuitive. I don't expect someone to walk through the Met and just sort of, uh, you know, through the American wing and take a look at a period room and just have something click and, mm -hmm. and start buying shaker furniture, right? It, it's, these things are, are difficult and we need more influences, more contemporary and relevant um, influences to instruct people that, um, that these are not pieces of statue, but that they're functional objects. Mm -hmm. um, and fundamentally, just great design. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I asked before about you know, um, Instagram and social media. We feel, you know, the editors at, for Sibs feel compelled to sort of feed our audience content that they may not actually want. Um, I also have the luxury, because I'm not at a magazine that needs advertisers or readers, um, so I don't need, we don't need to do things that necessarily get clicks. And we can feed people sort of more, less popular content that is somewhat educational, or it's about a collecting category that 
most people probably don't know that they should be interested in. And hopefully, you know, three or four of them actually are afterwards. Um, so we kind of feel it's our mission to promote brown furniture, let's say, or, you know, um, we now sell in new and custom furniture. Our audience, when we first started doing that three years ago, they came to us for vintage and antique. They didn't really have a lot of interest in, in, uh, in learning or reading about new and custom furniture. Now it's our fastest growing category. People, you know, we do more and more content and people do like it. But I sort of feel like in a way, as, a, as public persona, public people with a platform, like, do you have a mission? Are you going to keep, you know, promoting Adam Weimar, you know, furniture until, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm giving you this mission when you leave today? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I'm, I think that when we're working with clients, but also just, yeah, well, certainly when we're working with clients, I think that they're expecting us and, 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 and all designers really to, you know, to educate them, to surprise them, to open their eyes to things that they didn't know about or um, didn't understand maybe or didn't understand why they were good in the first place or interesting for them. Um, so I think, you know, in that relationship, obviously that's what, what we do, but um, to the larger, to the, to the rest of the world, I think, yeah, it, it is it is a fun aspect of 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 having an Instagram that people follow. I suppose is power imagining that you know maybe you're gonna make uh, four people like something that will make a few other people like something, and maybe you know you'll see the result of that in five years. Mm -hmm. So I expect all of you to go out and start, you know, talking about the appeal of Weimar era furniture because we're going to start a movement. It's going to go viral, and it started here. You'll all be able to say it. The hashtag so, started here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. This was wonderful. I wish we could continue all day. It's delightful, and thank you all for coming and listening, and um, and thank you to Tifa for hosting us here today. Of course. Thanks to this great audience. Thanks for the. I'm a fan of Weimar myself, so, you know, <laughs> favorite, wrote a dissertation around that period. Out. So, yeah. Oh, no. so, so we'll start it together, base. Adam. This is great. great. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you for being here. Please come back. Remember that it is on this live feed. Then we'll be on the website. So if you have friends, colleagues, people you think would like, would be interested in this topic, or if you want to review some of the things that our panelists have said today, please take advantage of that resource. Thank you so much. Have a great day at the fair.